Hello and welcome back. This week for episode nine, I am joined by Anna's Jane, conservation ecologist for BirdLife Singapore, who is going to be talking with us about the fight against the illegal and unsustainable bird trade, not just in Singapore, but across wider Asia. Anna's details just how widespread and difficult addressing private bird ownership has become in places like Java, the work they do, and they have been doing to identify and map trade routes before taking action, he outlines enforcement challenges and the dreadful impact of declining species on ecosystems, but he gives us some reasons to be hopeful as well. If you like this episode or would like to follow Anna's work, please follow the links in the description. And if you would like to support us or possibly make a donation, follow restoreourplanet.org or you can see us on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Enjoy the conversation. Hello and welcome back everybody listening to Restoral Planet podcast for episode nine with me your host Jack Cole. Here I'm joined with Anish Jane who works over at BirdLife. Uh, hello Anish, how are you? Good evening over in Singapore. Hi Jack, wonderful to meet you as well. Absolutely. So Thanks mind... for having me. Yeah no it's an absolute pleasure. So would you mind uh, just starting by giving our listeners a little bit about your background, your work, your sort of passions and how you've ended up working uh, where you are today? Sure. Um, I come from different backgrounds. Um, firstly, uh, biomimicry, um, entomology, uh, as well as uh, birds. So while I was doing my PhD, um, I got very interested in bird trade, um, you know, and it was partly because some of my lab mates were working on, on trade issues and kind of opened my eyes um, um, to this, this issue and you know, rest is history. Um, you know, I've been working for bird life uh, for nearly six years, uh, based out of Singapore, largely focusing on the Preventing Extinctions Program. Um, that program specifically looks at different species that are sort of threatened by trade, um, but more widely by different types of threats, be it habitat loss, be it climate change, be it yeah. So, bird life uh, has been working on bird trade issues across a number of uh, key groups, um, ranging from the helmeted hornbills to parrots, songbirds, as well as the illegal killing of birds. Um, and we really see it as an issue whereby birds like the helmeted hornbills are kept uh, for their ornamental value. Uh, birds such as the songbirds and parrots are kept uh, for cage bird trade. Um, and, and yet relatively poorly known, but a large portion of the hunting and trade is actually uh, for food delicacy and we are slowly but surely uh, trying to understand this big big issue you know? um, we've actually done a number of assessments globally where we've identified you know the, the killing of birds in the mediterranean europe uh, and other regions and we are now actually doing a situation analysis in southeast asia which is uncovering that many tens of millions of birds are killed every year uh, um, for food you know, it may seem like this is for subsistence, um, but that's only a small part of it. You know, uh, much of it is sort of um, just delicacy and uh, and sport as well, you know, and we're sort of understanding that. Um, but to sum it up, you know, a complex issue from uh, ornaments, cage bird trade, uh, to food and sport. Do you mind elaborating a little bit more on what the situation actually is like in terms of trade and, and numbers and the sort of the impacts that it's having? Yeah, so the bird trade really is a is an issue that spans borders. Um, you know, um, perhaps the most well-known trade of all is the songbird trade in Indonesia, um, where, you know, many millions of birds are actually kept in cages, uh, especially on the island of Java. Um, by some forecasts, there are more birds uh, in, in, in Javanese households than there are on the island of Java in the wild. Oh, wow. You know, which is weird. But, yeah. And, know, and how many I, is that? Just out of interest, how, what are the numbers there? Do you know? Um, several tens of millions. Goodness uh, me. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, a case in point is the Javan Pied Starling, which used to be a very common bird um, on the island of Java, you know, and also um, in South Sumatra. But, you know, now, guess what? There is zero in the wild. 
Zero. Yeah, one point one million in cages in captivity. Zero in the wild. Really shocking. shocking. So what's uh, yeah? So tell us a little bit about your work and where do you go from there? Is it a case of trying to get them re-released or are they already kind of uh, sort of tamed out of their wild ways? What what where uh, where do you go from there? Yeah, so the pied starling is a case in point where, you know, what we once thought is a common bird and therefore, you know, uh, it's kind of like the passenger pigeon where nobody thought, you know, it could go mm, extinct right. uh, in the wild or nearly extinct in the wild, um, you know. So it's sort of this persistent sort of uh, influx of birds from the wild to the trade uh, until a point where there's sort of nothing left uh, in the wild or at least no known population. Um, so, you know, the con conservation community is kind of uh, concerned. We've been uh, putting together emergency uh, sort of discussions and meetings, and we're trying to figure out um, this is a bird that we breed relatively easily. Uh, so mm -hmm. what can we actually do to sort of conserve it? You know, and, um, you know, as you would expect, it's far from simple. Right? The good news, though, is that um, we have a lot of birds in captivity, right? So there is that original stock that you can sort of rely on. Um, and that can form the basis of a sort of a founder population for conservation. The challenge is that, you know, it, it becomes hard to sort of acquire pure individuals, disease-free individuals that have not been inbred um, or have specific sort of uh, uh, hybrids or hybrids per se that, you know, may not be so uh, good to release in the wild, yeah. Um, so that is sort of the first step to establish a clean population. But then after that, the challenge only starts because what you need to do from there on is to figure out where is there a safe place to release these birds, you know. Um, and for that, you know, there is another discussion, you know, can we actually secure safe havens? You know, bird life is pretty big um, in terms of sort of securing safe habitats. Um, you know, because we feel, um, you know, by really understanding the site and sort of uh, working with the government, strengthening uh, enforcement measures and working with communities, we can actually, you know, um, secure these safe spots where birds can, can survive and thrive, you know, and through that, there could be an opportunity for people to actually you know, benefit from the birds, you know, through local tourism, um, through, um, you know, bird watching tours and things like that, you know, which will then make sure that birds are actually more valued in the wild than in cages. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting you say that. Um, would you say that some of, it sounds to me that some of the biggest uh, challenges there are actually are cultural ones, um, as much as anything, like, is that something that's historic? Have have these species been taken into captivity and traded? Is this a recent phenomena or has this been, you know, ongoing for, for generations? Right, that's a good question. And again, there are different variations to it. You know, um, we hear time and again that songbird keeping is sort of deeply rooted in Indonesian culture. Um, and it is in the, in the recent generations, uh, specifically in the Javanese culture, uh, but, at least my view is that um, it is a phenomenon that um, sort of became more commonplace um, since the Dutch were in Indonesia. Um, before that, there are fewer records of sort of Indonesians keeping songbirds. Um, and, and maybe it's something that, you know, sort of became popular back, back in those times and that it sort of uh, remained and, and sort of amplified over time. You know, but uh, whatever the historical connotations may be, 200 years ago, you know, since then it's quite popular, you know, and um, it's it's a big pastime hobby. And in fact, you know, strangely enough, even during COVID times when people could not go out, uh, on ground we hear that bird keeping actually increased because you know, mm. uh, people are kind of bored, right? And yeah. they need the pastime. So, you know, yeah. I was in, yeah. I was actually in Peru for uh, the first part of uh, COVID and lockdown and stuff, and puppy and dog ownership skyrocketed because 
basically wow. one of the only ways that people could were actually legally allowed to go outside was to walk dogs mm. so you saw this complete shift in the the market for uh, for these animals but um that's that that's, that that's really interesting and, and what's okay so moving on from there a little bit what's what implications does this this wildlife trade have on the, the wider ecosystems and how many mm. species are threatened and um sorry it's two very big questions there but what's the what's the wider impact yeah, so just consider the earlier sort of statement, if there are more birds in captivity, fewer oh, right. in the wild, you know, mm. um, you know, if that sinks in, what we're saying is, is that, you know, on a large scale of birds are being trapped from the wild to supply demand uh, for the cage bird trade, uh, we are slowly but slow, surely sort of depleting populations. And 10, 20 years ago, it wasn't so evident um, you know, it was feared, but now we've come to a point where um, several species are on the red list. You know, um, there is the Asian songbird trade specialist group uh, of which I'm a part and I'm the vice chair of the community engagement in that, in that specialist group. Um, and I personally feel it's a very important role because, you know, uh, as we talked about, bird keeping is deeply cultural, right? And therefore we need to bring communities if we ever need to make a difference, yeah? Uh, but anyway, all this has a huge impact on populations. Um, and if we don't do anything about it, then we really, really risk species going extinct very soon. Yeah. Would there then be a knock-on effect with other species that aren't, uh, aren't birds? Abs absolutely. Um, you know, we can imagine ecosystems are obviously connected and you know um when certain bird species sort of go extinct um their functions uh, would be difficult to replace uh, in the forests and uh, some of these could be seed dispersers could some of these could be pollinators um you know and these knock-on effects will sort of become evident um we we have this uh, term in conservation where we talk about silent forests. Mm -hmm. You know, there are there are the trees uh, standing, but you know the birds are gone, and so, so in a way they become silent. But which is which is sad by its own, right? You know, would of you course. walk sort of walk, and want to walk in a forest which is silent, not hear the bird calls? Sounds weird, but also I think it has huge implications on how forests would reproduce, and you know how much carbon can they sustain, how much life can they sustain, so on and so forth. You know, of course, and so obviously you're, you're based in Singapore. Um, this is, as I understand it, I mean, obviously, Asia is a Asia, I should say, is a massive continent. Um, is is Singapore like a kind of main point of this trade going on, or is, or is this really is it just one example among many different different uh, countries, different cities, different parts of Asia, which are all experiencing the similar uh, phenomena? Yeah, I think the phenomena is sort of definitely non-homogenous, you know. Um, the Indonesian songbird trade is better known, but there are, um, you know, many other countries sort of having their own versions, mm. you know. Um, songbird keeping is also popular in many other parts of Asia, such as in Thailand and Singapore, Vietnam, um, even Eastern Asia. Um, Singapore, for example, is often... Um, rather well known as a transshipment hub. It's a busy port for sure. And a lot of uh, species, including sort of species uh, of concern in wildlife trade come and go through the ports. That said, the uh, local authorities, Singapore government agencies are sort of doing a pretty good job in, in catching these shipments. Um, but yet trade goes on. It's, it's so hard to regulate at the, at the scale that which, you know, uh, containers move in and out. Um, here in Singapore, we've been sort of following the trade closely, and we uh, we we know parrot trade, for example, is is a big concern. Um, you know, um, they are freezing, and um, these these things come in um, from different corners of the world, from Africa, from South America, and um, you know there is domestic demand, and then there is also re-export. So, so there's a little bit of that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so more sort of practically speaking, in in uh, the work that you're doing, um, so in terms of like you know enforcement, uh, enforcing new policy, regulation, uh, conviction, 
uh, that kind of thing. How how is that sort of coming along? Is that is it becoming more effective? Uh, is it sort of not really working out? Are governments sort of being a bit slow to react? How's how's that side of things uh, uh, changing, mm. if at all? Yeah, I think that's that's a difficult question to answer because um, you know it's really varies country by country. You know? So we started talking about Singapore, so and I think Singapore, yeah, uh, easier. Sorry, I think, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think Singapore is is does enforcement pretty well. You know, right. uh, it's a small country, city, state, you know, relatively well resourced. And, you know, a good example is the straw headed bulbul, mm. which is critically endangered throughout uh, its range. But Singapore is the only last stronghold for the species. You know, and I think Singapore can sort of be happy that we've um, sort of kept the, the poaching in check. We've sort of mm. enforced the rules and therefore the population is still here. Whereas it's been depleted around the region, you know, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, so on and so forth. Um, but then, you know, automatically as countries become bigger, especially uh, decentralized, such as in Indonesia, with so many islands, um, each having its own uh, suite of endemic species, you know, large national parks, relatively uh, poorly resourced, you know, enforcement becomes a big challenge. Okay, okay. So yeah. we mentioned a few uh, a few species specifically so far. Would you mind talking a little bit about the, the helmeted hornbill, which is a species mm -hmm. quite close to my heart and it's quite iconic in the illegal mm -hmm. uh, trade because of its its caskets, uh, you know, its, its its features. So would you mind telling us a little bit about, um, yeah, what's going on with the helmeted mm -hmm. hornbill? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so helmeted hornbill is one of the largest hornbills. Um, in Asia, you know, and it's quite unique because, uh, as you said, it's got it's the only species with a solid cask, mm. um, you know, which is largely um, and and for that solid cask, it's sort of involved in these headbutting contests, you know, mm. um, which is believed to be for uh, for territory or for food, you know. Uh, but despite that big helmet, you know, the bird is sort of in danger. Right? How yeah. ironic! <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah. Um, it's found, and it's one of those species which is like found across five different countries, uh, from Mi Myanmar to Brunei. Uh, but despite having a relatively large range, you know, it's critically endangered because um, the threat is is so severe. And the casks are actually sold um, in the black market uh, for several uh, hundreds of hundreds of dollars, and sometimes even more. And that creates a demand. And so um, there have been a lot of efforts by the conservation community, including sort of setting up uh, a working group, which um, I co-coordinate uh, along with uh, Mandai Nature here in Singapore. And we were also closely involved and in sort of co-leads in developing the Helmeted Home Action Plan, um, which sort of lays out the steps that are necessary to protect this bird um, as, a, as a consortium, as a, as a group. And then we, through this working group, we have, we've been tackling the issue, right? From the supply, the trade, as well as the demand side. And so, um, you know, harder said than done, right? Um, right, we, right. If, you, if, if you have a bird that is in demand, how do you sort of protect it uh, at the source? And so, you know, it starts off first by knowing exactly where the birds are, how many, and, um, you know, which are, which locations are the are best bets to just protect them. So we work with our partners to sort of identify the safe havens for these birds. Uh, we did a lot of rapid assessments. We did a lot of uh, predictive modeling to really sort of understand which locations could have the birds, you know, and then we sort of did targeted surveys. We identified new locations and then we sort of uh, did more fundraising um, and put in programs. Um, so, uh, populations could be identified and then we sort of slowly moving into a phase where we are developing more detailed sort of work programs, working with communities and, and sort of these hornbill guardians, which um, are really stewards um, to protect hornbills, you know. And while all this work, uh, really important work is happening at the source site, uh, where the birds are, we are also mindful that we need to work uh, all across the supply chain. Uh, here we collaborate with partners like Traffic, 
you know, right. who have been monitoring the trade very closely. Um, and so just sort of mapping out where, where is the demand? You know, is it increasing, decreasing? What's going on? Um, what are some of the drivers? And then sort of that, that then that feeds into the demand side um, as well. You know, how do we sort of understand who's buying? And then um, through that sort of slowly trying to change behaviors you know, because essentially this is an issue about demand, right? And so yeah. how do we eventually make sure that uh, helmeted hornbill casks uh, are not in demand? They are sort of socially unacceptable to be kept. Right, right. Yeah. Obviously, you, you've spoken about Java, but it's interesting what you're saying there in terms of mapping and you finding out who the targets, or, or essentially who, where the markets are, who's buying these things. Is it sort of, is it like a status symbol? And so, mm-hmm. like, is, for example, is this like richer people who are maybe a bit of middle upper class, you sort of feel like they want to sort of show off a little bit, like essentially the equivalent of people who you would imagine might buy ivory, obviously not today's different, but back in the day, it's that kind of mentality, would you say? Definitely so. Right. Um, and if you look at the history, the helmeted hornbill casks have actually been uh, in trade for a number of centuries. Uh, so these were, were sort of popular among the um, the kings and the emperors who could afford a higher price. You know, and it's believed that as sort of middle class expanded wealth uh, became more, uh, you know, uh, came at our disposal, so to speak, you know, the demand increased. Um, incre- and also increasingly, uh, there are people who sort of um, think about buying wildlife uh, collectibles, you know, so there is the elephant ivory, there's a rhino horn, and then there is the elephant mm-hmm. no cask. Um, and we're trying to understand this better, uh, like what are the connections and sort of are are people who are buying elephant ivory also buying halal uh, no casks, uh, mm. or or is there sort of a different market? Uh, well, from what we understand so far, there is a pretty decent overlap, you know, and and mm. therefore, um, yeah, definitely a little bit of status symbol thing going on. Right. And so, looking at the the other end of the spectrum, there, what what effect is this this trade having on indigenous communities? But mm. Again, sort of around sort of Singapore, rather than sort of jumping around uh, uh, all of Asia again. So, yeah, what, what, more locally, what's the what's mm-hmm. the effects? Yeah, I mean to answer that question, and to be fair, I think we could perhaps go a little broader and sort of look at Indonesia, Malaysia, and etc., where there are more indigenous communities. Um, and, and so it's it's got sort of mixed effects in my opinion, you know. Um, a lot of times uh, the, the trade is actually being driven by organized crime networks. Um, definitely the case for sort of helmeted hornbill uh, casks where the demand is sort of quite organized. Um, and therefore we see that and there are uh, these, these supply chains and the middlemen sort of reaching out to the indigenous communities to be able to supply these casks. And so what impact would that have on the communities? Well, um, a lot of communities sort of uh, stand up uh, to say, you know, um, <clears throat> they've been obviously living there for a while and um, many of them sort of really like the birds, they, they really like the forest and um, for them, you know, the bird has strong cultural uh, invitations as well. Yeah? Um, and for that reason, um, especially the helmet the Hornbill is sort of, um, in some cultures, even revered, you know, like in uh, Sarawak, born, wider Borneo. And, and so people sort of, you know, given that special connection to, to the bird, they don't really hunt it in the past. And so... Now with this demand, I think it's sort of created a new dynamic. You know? Some indigenous communities would definitely um, stand by the culture, I should say, and, and would like to protect it. You know, um, it's it's something they would not want to lose because you know they are uh, they've sort of grown up with the helmeted hunter call in the forest, which is so unique, uh, and, and this laughing call. You know, whereas perhaps whereas yeah, there might be others who who, for lack of a better word, 
may give in, right? Mm -hmm. um, because after all, everybody sort of, um, you know, um, may want um, some money, may, may have uh, some expenses to feed off, so to speak, right? And therefore that, that presents a challenge, you know, what dynamic plays out at the local community level. And right. herein, we've, we sort of want to um, go in there and work with communities to make sure that the value of the hornbills is sort of understood. You know, these, we say, are the farmers of the forest because these hornbills sort of fly long distances. They're big, gigantic, majestic birds. And right. they can disperse sort of large seeds across the landscape. You know, these are rare birds as well. And, and so, you know, there is definitely value in sort of having them across a large landscape. So once people understand that and say, hey, by protecting these birds, uh, you know, you can not only sort of benefit the forest, but also sort of uh, develop ecotourism uh, around it, you know? Um, and yeah, and I think once people realize that, then sort of changes the dynamic a little bit, even at the local and indigenous community level. And do you think people are beginning to realize that? I think so, definitely. Um, I think the first step really is to help raise, raise awareness and sort of um, raise the profile of the bird and sort of make sure that people want to keep it um, for its own sake, you know? Right. Um, um, and then we sort of try to add in the second layer and say, hey, what if uh, there are ecotourism sort of and bird watching benefits that could be attached to it? Okay. You know, and and okay. you feel communities are definitely picking up. You know. okay. So moving on from, well, sort of going with that a little bit, Anuj, what do we have to be optimistic about with this, uh, okay. with these issues for the future? Perhaps the next generation, nothing's changing, are the kids a bit more kind of putting their foot down and having none of it? And uh, can you see like a shift in public perceptions? And what, what, what have we got mm -hmm. to be excited about and feel good about in the coming, uh, the coming years for, mm -hmm. for these species? Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's, it's, we are at this critical juncture, in my opinion, whereby, you know, people have gotten more wealthy, you know, and with internet, um, the world is definitely more connected. Uh, you know, we've, we've got all this social media and, you know, all these websites, classified websites, e-commerce websites, and, and several of them actually make it easier uh, for people to buy wildlife products. You know, mm, right. um, um, and we didn't talk about that, but it's a big problem, right? Um, so um, there's definitely increase in demand uh, on one side. Right. Okay. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Um, right. Right. And then, uh, you know, with the with the whole realization that you know um, we've just finished COP twenty six, and you know, people have mm. been sort of excited to say. Um, you know, climate change has been at the forefront. Uh, biodiversity has been uh, becoming more mainstream. People right. are realizing that that keeping biodiversity forests are valuable, right? So I do feel that, you know, slowly but surely we are sort of moving towards a consciousness where we want to value biodiversity more and more, you know? So, um, and it's evident in the newer generation, right? Right. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see um, you know, with the millennials having greater access to internet, but also greater awareness, you know, more demand, more awareness, how does it pan out, right? Um, definitely conservationists have to become smarter. You know, we cannot just rely on just protecting birds in the wild. You know, I think if we have to solve wildlife trade, we've sort of uh, uh, begin to understand psychology. We have to understand how, how do people think? How can we change behaviors? How can we change mindsets? And how can we influence them in a way that um, keep keeping wildlife products, uh, especially those that are sort of captured from the wild, um, is no longer acceptable? Absolutely. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's finish with this. What would you like to see in in say ten years, Anuj? How would things yeah. have changed for the positive? What's what can we try to envision for the coming years. Yeah, I'd like to see a world in which, you know, we respect nature, we value nature, and we sort of uh, admire um, birds and other wildlife out there in the wild, you know. Um, I'm not against trade. I think um, 
wildlife trade. So keeping um, sort of cage birds is all right, as long as they're sort of coming from captive bred sources, you know. And so I hope that uh, in some years, you know, bird trade specifically would sort of move away from keep a wild caught birds and it would slowly and surely move towards sort of the more established birds, such as the lovebirds, the budgies, uh, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And, right. and, and then, you know, globally, and even in Asia, we have sort of this greater um, appreciation for birds in the wild. Definitely. Well, you've, you've, you sort of hit sort of quite a contentious issue there because generally in the, in, in the UK anyway, the idea of caged birds uh, ruffles a lot of feathers, shall we say, if I'm gonna throw out a, throw out a pun. But um, um, Anuj, thank you so much for your time and uh, everything else. So where can people find you and follow you if they want to see what you're up to in your work and how things are progressing? Yeah, I'd be happy uh, for people to connect on LinkedIn or social media and Facebook um, or find me on the BirdLife website. Fantastic. All right, Anuj, thank you so much for your time.